good morning, everyone. And you're most welcome here to our service of worship here in Carrieduff this morning. So whether you're with us here in the meeting house or watching through the link into the hall or even viewing here with us on YouTube and DVD, you're most uh, welcome to our uh, meeting this morning. We do appreciate those who have been unable to join with us thus far for various reasons and use YouTube and the DVDs. And we trust it won't be long before we're all able to meet again, as we're accustomed to in our meeting house. A, well, warm, uh, a warm welcome to those who may be visiting with us this morning. We hope you have felt already the warmth of our welcome here. Our evening service again will be uh, via Zoom, and it will be at 6.30pm, and the Reverend Trevor Cain will lead us in that as well. Reverend Smith continues to be on holidays until Tuesday of this week, so he's back in post from Wednesday, and until then, uh, as has been the previous, during the previous month, the Reverend Richard Patton of Trinity Board Mills is looking after our pastoral needs. So thanks to, to Richard for his care and attention to us. We appreciate it again. And so if you do need uh, the services from Minister for Pastoral Needs, etc., do feel free to phone Richard up until Tuesday or contact myself, or of course you can contact your district elder any time. Please note this is our last Sunday in August, so next Sunday is our first uh, Sunday in September, and we will revert to meeting at 11.30 p.m., so 11.30 p.m. for worship here. A.m. You can come at 11.30 p.m. if you wish. <laughs> Sorry, 11.30 a.m. next Sunday morning here in the meeting house, and God willing, the Reverend Smith will be back with us to lead us in worship. And again, the evening service will be via Zoom next Sunday as well. Session meeting, just to make elders aware, our next session meeting will be on Tuesday, the 7th September at 7.30 p.m. And we intend to meet in person in the church hall. I will forward minutes and minutes uh, and uh, agenda for that in the coming days. Again, thanks to Sarah again for leading us in our worship this morning. Uh, we may not always appreciate maybe how difficult it is just for one person at the front to lead us in our worship, especially when we're all covered in masks and we're singing softly. So, Sarah, we really appreciate you leading us, and uh, we're with you as you lead us. We know it's not an easy task, but thank you. We thank you for that. Again, for those in the sound desk, thank you again. And for our stewards who keep us safe and our buildings clean, do uh, uh, abide by their instructions. They're here to keep us safe. Just on that, lots of people about our congregation do lots of small things unnoticed, but they sometimes don't go unnoticed. We, we are aware of lots of things going on, so we thank you most sincerely for those little things you do for us and collectively make us able to meet here Sunday by Sunday. So if you see somebody you know they're doing, so encourage them, uh, be kind to them. So let's be encouragers, let's be kind to one another, and let us uh, just be there for one another through these times as we come out of lockdown. Uh, you'll be glad here's my last Sunday for t some time making announcements. You'll be glad here's my last time promoting a risk assessment. Again, these are very important. Please get one. There are a number of organisations who still haven't got one from me. It's up to you to get it from me and to return it. These must be returned before any event or before any organisation can meet. And that includes the taking care stuff as well. They have to be, have to be completed before you can meet. No form, no meet. It's basically the the thing in that. I am aware there are some organisations and your HQs or your governing bodies have maybe said you're not meeting immediately in September. I think one has said October. But still get the form filled in. Have it done early. Have it back to me. And we can sign that off and bring it forward to session. I think that is all the announcements we have to make this morning. Apart from just, it's my delight to welcome to our pulpit uh, the Reverend Trevor Cain, who's assistant and first poured it down. It's his first time in the pulpit, though, our, our first time with us. He, he is a, a relation of our own Trevor, um, or Peter Burke. So he has been in our congregation uh, before, but it's our first time in the pulpit. Trevor, we, 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 warm, we warmly welcome you to our church this morning, and thank you for agreeing us to lead us in our worship. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be with you here. Uh, thank you to uh, Ian for the, the warm welcome that I've received. Just to tell you a little bit uh, about myself, uh, I'm Trevor. I'm married to Suzanne. That's Peter's uh, sister. And we have five uh, children. We have Noah, who's eight, Eli, who's six, Judah, who's four, Eva, who's two, 
and Joseph, who's 13 weeks. I think that's all five. Uh, they'll be in there. They'll be in there somewhere. Uh, I was formerly minister in Dumfries Free Church of Scotland, very southwest uh, of Scotland. If you get off the boat and you're heading for England, you'll drive uh, on the ring road around Dumfries. Uh, I was there for uh, about four years, and I'm now in the process of transferring my ministry over to the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, hopefully. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I have to experience the wider uh, Presbyterian Church family rather than just what's happens in First Port of Down. Uh, and so I've basically been begging anyone who I know or have a vague connection to, can I come and preach in their congregation, which is how uh, I've ended up with you this morning and carried off through our connection with uh, Peter and Kelly and the boys. But more than that, it's good to be gathered together to worship the Lord. It's good to be gathered together to praise his name. We're going to think this morning about the letter to the church in Ephesus as we find it in Revelation chapter 2. And the great theme of that letter, one of the great uh, uh, instructions of that letter is to remember your first love. The Ephesians had fallen away from their love for Jesus, their love for the Lord, and he instructs them to return. So as our call to worship this morning, we read these very famous uh, verses from Joshua 24. Joshua instructs the people, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We've gathered together this morning as people who hopefully will choose to serve the Lord, who will choose to love him with our whole hearts. As we begin our time of worship this morning, let's join our hearts together in prayer. And I'll invite you to stand if you're able as we join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we give you thanks for this opportunity that we have to come together this opportunity that we have to sing your praise, this opportunity that we have to encourage one another, to meet with one another, albeit in very difficult, very different circumstances than that which we're used to. But we pray, Father, that you would be with us now. We pray that you would bless our time together. We pray that you would encourage us in our walk with you. We pray that as we come now, Father, that you would still our hearts, that you would enable us, as the psalmist says, to be still and know that you are God. May you remove the thoughts from the week gone. May you remove the cares and concerns of what has passed. May you remove the worry from our hearts from the week ahead. And as we gather together this morning, Father, we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would go before us into our time of worship, that you would cleanse us from our sin that you would forgive us and remove all our iniquity from us. And truly that as we leave this morning, we can say that it was good to be together in the Lord's house. Bless our time together now. Shut us in with yourself, we ask, and go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your seats again. And we're going to remain seated as we begin our opening praise, Christ our hope in life and death.
Well, if you have a Bible in front of you, I encourage you to turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 2. What we're going to, to do today with the course of the two services, God willing, is we're going to look at the first and the last of these seven letters to the seven churches that make up Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We're going to look at the letter to the church in Ephesus this morning and think about that together. And then later on this evening, God willing, we'll look at the letter to the church in Laodicea at the end of Revelation chapter 3. But this morning we're in Revelation chapter 2, uh, and we're going to read the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and beginning to read at verse 1, this is the word of God. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. This is the reading of God's inspired and inerrant word. And we trust that God will bless the reading of his word to our souls. Now, I know that there, there's uh, not that many boys and girls who are in the meeting house this morning. There might be a few more in the hall and there might be a few more uh, catching up with us later online or on YouTube. Uh, but I just want to, to, to speak to you for a few moments. Now, there was something very special happened in our house yesterday, a very special occasion. And I brought a card along with me just to show you, see if you can work out what that occasion was. Now, I don't know if you can see the, 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 the picture too well. I'm trying to cover up the occasion just uh, to, to give you a chance. But the picture on the front of the card shows two aisles. And one of the aisles is, well, depends what way you want to look at it, really, I suppose, doesn't it? One of the aisles might be trying to peck out the eye of the other aisle. Or if you take a more positive view of it, one of the aisles might be giving the other aisle a little kiss, a little peck on the cheek. Now, it was Suzanne and I's uh, anniversary yesterday. We were married for 11 years yesterday. I'll not embarrass myself by reading out what's uh, on the inside of the card, but this was the card that I sent to Suzanne saying, Happy Anniversary. Now, imagine if I'd got this card that said, Happy Anniversary, and I'd wrote inside it, Dear Suzanne, I don't really like you that much anymore. I wouldn't have fancied my chances of getting any dinner last night. Or, dear Suzanne, you're not the woman that I first married, and I think we should go our separate ways. Now, that wouldn't have been a very nice thing to write, would it? It wouldn't have made Suzanne feel loved or valued or cherished, and it would have caused a lot of problems. In this letter that we read about, in this letter that, that, that Jesus gave to the church in Ephesus, we read effectively that that's what some of the people in the church at Ephesus had done. They had abandoned their first love. They had forgotten the love that they had for Jesus at the start. Their love had grown cold, and they no longer loved him as they once did. And you know, sometimes that's easy for those things to happen. We have lots of people telling us that we shouldn't follow Jesus. We have lots of things that are in our lives that perhaps mean make it difficult for us to follow Jesus. We start out with great enthusiasm. We start out with great vigor following Jesus. But over the years, that love grows cold. 
that passion that we had for Jesus goes away. And so, boys and girls, if you're in the church or if you're in the hall or if you're catching up online, what I want you to, to encourage you to do this morning is to love Jesus with your whole heart, to follow him all your days, to always love him because he will not let you down. His love for you will not grow cold. His love for you will not falter. Follow him, love him, and learn from him. Well, we're going to have our uh, children's praise now, which is when I was lost. Uh, and after that, the children are going to head out to uh, Children's Church. So please remain seated as we join our hearts together in When I Was Lost. Well, friends, again, I'd invite you to stand, if you're able, as we bring our prayers of intercession before the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we give you thanks that your love for us never grows cold, that you have covenanted to love us till the end, that you have covenanted to bring us into glory with your Son. As we come this morning, we confess that our love often grows cold, that our love often waxes and wanes depending on the season, depending on our mood, depending on so many factors. But yet we thank you as we come this morning that you are the God who has loved us from before the foundation of the world, that you are the God who has set his seal upon us. We thank you as we come this morning that you are the God who is in control of all things, that you are the God who is sovereign over the affairs of mankind. 
And we confess, Heavenly Father, that sometimes it's difficult to see that. As we witness what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment, it's difficult to understand how you will bring about your good purpose. It's difficult to understand how you will bring about good out of such tragedy and such seeming chaos. But yet we thank you this morning that you are the God who will do that, that you are the God who will do all things well. We want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan as they face renewed difficulties and renewed hostilities in the days to come. That even before the, the, the Taliban retook control, it was considered one of the most difficult places for a person to be a Christian. That situation is only going to have worsened. And so we want to pray for them, Father, that you would give them strength in the days that lie ahead, that you would give them courage in the days that lie ahead, that you would give them hope and confidence in you, that despite their outward circumstances, despite what's happening around them, they would know that you are the God who saves them, the God who cares for them and protects them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bring some order out of this chaos. As we come this morning, Father, we want to pray for our own nation as we continue to battle with this coronavirus and all of the, the different things that are happening. We pray, Father, that this new wave would indeed have peaked, that we would begin to see a, a, a reduction in the, the number of cases, a reduction in the number of hospitalizations, a reduction in the number of deaths. We pray, Father, that we would indeed be able to return to a new normal relatively soon that we would be able to return to our organizations, that we would be able to return to our, our worship of you unrestricted. We pray for our doctors and nurses and all those who work in the NHS, that you would give them renewed strength in these difficult days. May they know your presence going with them. May they know your strength upholding them. And may you, Heavenly Father, watch over them as they have to make and, and give very difficult treatments at different times. May you be near to them in all that they do. We remember the congregation here in Carried Off, and we pray for Alistair as he returns from his holiday. We pray, Father, that you would bring him back refreshed, that you would bring him back reinvigorated, that you bring him back ready for the next season of work that lies ahead. We pray for his work as he continues to be the, the vacancy convener in Killy Lay, and we pray, Father, that you would bless him in that work. You would bless him in that ministry that you have prepared for him to do. We pray that the congregations would uh, come together, that that official uh, merger of the two congregations would come together soon. And we pray, Father, for us ourselves as we come to your word now. We pray that the Spirit would minister mightily amongst us, that he would soften our hard hearts, that he would unstop our deaf ears, that he would remove the scales from our eyes. We pray, Father, that we would not be those who hear the word only, but that we would be those who do the word as well. So go before us now and bless us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, I'd invite you to turn with me, please, to these verses in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 through 7, this letter to the church in Ephesus. Revelation 2, 1 to 7, and we're going to think about this whole letter together this morning. One of the jobs that I had before I went into ministry was as a checkout team leader in Sainsbury's at Hollywood Exchange. Now, part of that role involved giving, uh, giving other colleagues feedback on how they were interacting with the customers. Now, this wasn't written down explicitly as policy, I don't think, but very often the feedback you gave them would come in a positive and a negative, and then another positive, to send them out of the meeting room kind of thinking that they were doing their job well, energized to continue working for the company. So, you know, they'd come in and you'd say, well, I, I watched your interaction with that customer. You welcomed them well. You smiled at them well. Now, you didn't offer to pack their bags for them. So next time, maybe you could think about that. Think about offering to help packing with them. And then it was great the way that you gave them their change and smiled and said, goodbye, that sort of thing, a positive, a negative, and then finally a positive to send them away with. And as we come to Revelation chapter 2, as we come to these seven letters to the seven churches, we find Jesus doing something very similar to the churches that he writes to. As he begins the letter to them, he reminds them of something that they're doing well. He encourages them in something that they're doing well. 
In the majority of the letters, he'll hold something against them. He'll remind them of where they've fallen. He'll give them something to work on. And then as he finishes the letter, he sends them away with another positive. And as we come to this letter, as we come to the the letter to the church in Ephesus this morning, we want to think about three things and see three things together from this letter. Firstly, we want to think about the suffering church, how the first positive thing that Jesus reminds them of is how they've endured suffering. They're bearing up well despite the opposition to them. Despite the people who are out to get them, they're holding fast their faith in Jesus. But secondly, then, we'll see the forgetful church. This is the negative side of it, if you like. Jesus says to them, look, you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten the way that you used to love me, the passion that you used to have for me. And then thirdly and finally, we'll see the faithful church. As Jesus reminds them of this other positive thing that they have, yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, whom I also hate. The suffering church, the forgetful church, and the faithful church. So the suffering church then, and we see that in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2, the suffering church. Now we need to understand what we're coming to here as we come to the book of Revelation. We're not coming to one of the pastoral epistles. We're not coming to one of the gospels. We're coming to a very particular genre of biblical literature. We're coming to the apocalyptic literature. It speaks of the end of time. And the most, you know, the, the thing that it's probably most akin to in the Bible is prophecy. And we almost have to read this like prophecy. So as we read things, we don't necessarily take them literally. We understand that as a a prophet might speak figuratively, so that as the book of Revelation speaks, sometimes it speaks to us figuratively. And the best way that I think that I've ever read of, of describing Revelation is that it's vision, not video. John is given a vision of what's coming. He's given a, a, a vision of the end of times. He's not given a video recording cassette that he plugs in and watches. It's a vision of what's to come. And we say that by way of introduction because as we come to verse 1, there's some things that immediately aren't what they seem to be. We see verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. John addresses, well, Jesus addresses this letter through John to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, as we read that term angel, how are we going to understand it? What are we going to think of as we think of an angel? You know, we might think of the angel who came to visit Mary or Joseph, that supernatural angel Gabriel. But a messenger in biblical terms could simply be a messenger. It was one who was sent with a particular message. It was one who was sent with a particular uh, uh, message to bring to the people. And so as we read about this, if you read the seven, if you read the seven letters to the seven churches, you'll read about the angels to each church. So it seems best, I think, to think of this angel as simply a human messenger, as simply someone who brought God's message to that congregation. And as we read it here, I think it makes most sense to think of this messenger as the the minister, if you like, of the church in Ephesus. The the, The angel is God's messenger. The minister is God's messenger to that particular congregation. The... We prayed for the nation of Afghanistan in our our prayers of intercession. And the ambassador to Afghanistan has been on the news a lot this week, hasn't he? But what is an ambassador? It's one messenger within that nation. It's the messenger of one nation within another nation. So here too, the minister in Ephesus is God's messenger to that congregation. He brings the word of God to that congregation. And what's John to write? What's John to remind the church in Ephesus about? What's Jesus tell the church in Ephesus? Well, we see that at the, the, the second half of verse 1. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks amongst the golden lampstands, the seven golden lampstands. So again here, there's rich imagery. There's rich understanding to be had here. Seven, of course, is the biblical number of perfection. It's the biblical number of completeness. So what's in effect is being said here? The words of him who holds the seven stars 
It's complete. It's full. Whatever the seven stars stand for, it's the fullness of them. It's all of them. Jesus holds the seven stars in his right hand. Jesus holds the whole number of Christians in his right hand, in his hand of power, in his hand of authority. The Christians are in the hand of Jesus Christ, are in the hand of the one who has power and authority. Then we're told about these seven golden lampstands. These seven lampstands stand for churches. And so again, we have Jesus walking amongst these seven golden lampstands. We have Jesus walking amongst the church of Christ. What we have here is the whole church universal. And Jesus knows. Jesus sees. Jesus is care, cares for and is concerned with these seven churches. With a whole number of God's elect. It's encouraging, isn't it? It's encouraging this morning to know that if we are faithful to Jesus Christ, that if we are a true church of Jesus Christ, then Jesus walks amongst us. Jesus knows us. Jesus cares for us. Jesus is concerned for us. Jesus holds us in his mighty power. What we have really here in verse 1 then is the assurance from John that the words he's writing to the church in Ephesus are nothing less than the words of Jesus. They're nothing less than the words of him who holds the church in his power. And what does Jesus want to assure this church in Ephesus of? What does he want to remind them of? Well, we see verse 2. He assures them that he knows their works. He knows their toil. He knows their patient endurance. He knows that they cannot bear with those who are evil. He knows that they've tested those who call themselves apostles and found them to be false. He knows that they're enduring patiently. He knows that they're bearing up for his name's sake and not growing weary. Jesus wants to assure the church in Ephesus that he sees them. He wants to assure them that he knows the situation they're living in. He wants them to understand that he sees and he cares. He knows what they're enduring for their faith. He knows the sacrifices that they're making. He sees and he cares. Ephesus as a, a, a city was a city that was entrenched in the worship of the goddess Diana. It would have had pagan statues and shrines and temples all around it. It was also a city that was enshrined in the worship of the emperor. Everyone in the city would have been expected to burn their pinch of incense and declare that Caesar is Lord. But against that, Jesus writes to this church in Ephesus and he says, look, I know what you're going through. I know that you're not bowing the knee. I know that you're not worshipping Diana. I know that you're not worshipping Caesar. I know that you're patiently enduring despite everything that's stacked against you. I know that you're standing for my name. You see, these Christians wouldn't have worshipped the emperor. They wouldn't have worshipped Diana. They would have said, no, God is the only God who is worthy of our worship. God is the true and living God, the God of heaven and earth. So it's very little wonder that they experienced the hardship and the persecution that we read about here. But what's in that for us this morning? You know, we're not facing a great deal of hardship here in Northern Ireland. We're not experiencing a great deal of persecution here. So what can we learn from this? Well, we need to be making sure that our faith in Christ is making a difference in our everyday lives. That being a Christian makes a difference in how we live Monday to Saturday, not just on Sunday. That people can see the difference that having Jesus as our Lord and Savior makes. You see, it was perfectly clear to everyone in Ephesus that having Jesus as their Lord changed how these Ephesian Christians lived. They wouldn't just burn the incense and get on with it. They wouldn't worship Diana and fit in with the rest of society. But I wonder, do people see the same difference in us as Christians? Do people see the difference that making Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our lives has to us?
You see, we can get so caught up in having all of the right doctrines and ticking all of the right boxes and saying, well, we believe in justification through faith alone, in Christ alone. And of course, that's true. But James reminds us the faith that saves us never remains alone. It shows itself in how we live. But secondly, I think this passage passage encourages us in our doing good. Ian mentioned it in his uh, announcements about people who serve in unseen ways and do things that no one else actually sees or really appreciates. But this passage reminds us that Jesus does see it. Jesus does know what we're doing for his kingdom, and we will be rewarded for it. The church has its problems. The church here in Ephesus has its problems. We're going to think about those just now. But Jesus saw their good points. He commended them for what they were doing well. He encouraged them in what they were doing well. The suffering church he sees, and he assures them that he knows and he understands. But secondly then, we think about the forgetful church. The forgetful church. And we see that in verses 4 and 5. It's a pattern that is repeated, as we said at the start, it's a pattern that's repeated throughout the letters to the seven churches. They're commended for something, but then Jesus writes and reminds them that he does have something against them. There's something that they're not doing well. There's something that they're falling down in. And what is it here? Well, we're told, verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. This love which was so evident at the beginning, this love which was so prevalent at the beginning is beginning to wane. They're beginning to grow weary. They're beginning to think, well, do we really need Jesus? Do we really need the hassle that following Jesus brings? Do we need this persecution? Is Jesus worth the persecution that's coming our way? Other things are coming in and choking that love. Other cares and concerns are coming in and choking the love that they had for Christ. That's a pretty stark warning, isn't it? Because think, Jesus has just finished extolling all of their virtues. He's just finished extolling all of the things that they're doing well. And yet he says to them here, but your love's waning. You might be enduring hardship, yes, but your love's growing cold. You might be enduring persecution, yes, but your heart's wandering far from me. You see, they could do all of these great things. They could endure all of the hardship and difficulty that they had, and yet their heart was still growing cold. Their love was still waning. It's a bit like somebody perhaps today, I was trying to think of the the best way to illustrate this. It's a bit like somebody today who gets into a profession because they think they'll love it. They think they've been called to it, you know, a doctor or a policeman or whatever it is. And yet as you talk to them towards the end of their career, that love that they had at first, that passion that they had at first for the job that they're doing is gone. And all that keeps them going is a sense of duty and the thought of the pension that's going to come at the end. They thought they'd love it, but all that keeps them going is a sense of duty. Or perhaps we might see it in some old married couples. That love that they had at first, that spark that they had at first, that first drew them together is gone. And all that keeps them going is that sense of duty to the promises that they'd made all those years ago. Duty has replaced love as the motivator. Duty has replaced love as the thing that keeps the fires going. And that's how it was for the Ephesians here. Their love had grown cold. Jesus points them back to their conversion at first. He says, remember, remember the love that you had at first. Remember how you used to love me. Remember how you used to love the gospel. Think about that and repent. Repent. Because you need to get back to that. You need to return to that love that you had at first. And it's a stark reminder for us. 
Because if we're, all, if we're honest, it's all too easy for familiarity to creep in to the Christian life. It's easy to lose the wonder of grace. That sinners such as us, sinners such as us who've shaken our fist in God's faces, who've told God that we want nothing to do with Him, who've gone our own way, are brought into the kingdom of God. That God sent Him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the wonder of grace. That's the amazing grace. But it's grace that we can become all too familiar with. We think, well, we're not actually that bad. We're good, respectable people. We have this sort of life together. And before you know it, the love that we had at first is gone. Are we in danger this morning of receiving the same warning that the church here in Ephesus did? Are we in danger of losing our first love for Christ? If we are, then we need to repent and return to that first love. Why, though? What reasons does Jesus give here? Why does he tell the church in Ephesus to return to their first love? Why does he tell them to repent? Well, he tells them to repent because the consequences are pretty serious, aren't they? What does he say at the end of verse 5? Remember, therefore, from when you have fallen... Repent and do the works you did at first. Then what does Jesus say? If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. If they don't repent, Jesus says, he's going to come and remove their lampstand from them. Now we thought about the imagery, didn't we, a little bit earlier. What's the imagery that's being used here? Jesus says that if they don't repent, if they don't remember their first love, if they don't return to him with all of their hearts, then he will come and remove their lampstand from them. He will come and effectively de-church them, if you like. They will no longer be a true congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be treated as apostates. They will be treated as non-Christians, as those who never knew grace. It's a sobering thought for us that Jesus can de-church us if we lose that love for him, if we lose that, lose that zeal for him, if we lose that wholehearted commitment to him and to his church. We can be de-Christianized. We can be treated as apostates. It's a serious warning that Jesus gives to the church in Ephesus, and it's a serious warning that Jesus gives to us here. We need to have that same love for Christ that we had at first. Jesus threatens to remove the lampstand from among the church in Ephesus because they do not love him. They do not love his word. They do not love his people. It's a warning that we need to heed. But we don't finish this section on that note. We don't finish this section on that somber note. Because there's a note of hope, isn't there? Yes, there's a message of judgment. Yes, there's a message of warning. Yes, there's a message of condemnation if they don't. But notice that Jesus has this little caveat, this little aside at the end of verse 5. Do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. There's hope even in the midst of this judgment. There's hope even in the midst of this darkness. There's hope even in the midst of this difficulty. Jesus says to them, repent. Turn around. Come to me. Come and have that love that you had at first. Return to your old way of doing things. And then everything will be grand. If there's true and genuine repentance, if there's a true, genuine turning again to the Lord, then this, this, this judgment doesn't need to fall upon them. This fate doesn't need to come to them. This destiny will be avoided if 
they repent. Wherever you are this morning, friends, whatever hole that you feel that you're in, whatever darkness it is that you feel is closing in around your life, don't lose hope. The message of the Christian gospel is that there's always hope with Jesus. That if we repent, if we come to him, if we turn to him, he will hear us and he will answer us. There's no situation that is beyond the reach of the grace of God, that is beyond the mercy of our Savior. Repent, Jesus says. The suffering church, the forgetful church, and then finally, thirdly, the, the, the faithful church, the faithful church. And we see that in verses 6 and 7. Jesus doesn't finish the letter on that somber note. He doesn't finish the letter on that note of judgment. Instead, he comes back to the positives. He finishes with another commendation for them. This time pointing out that they share this common enemy. Verse 6, that, yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's this common enemy. There's this common foe to them both. And it's the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know too much about them. We don't know too much about who they were other than to say that they were clearly enemies of God and enemies of God's people. That God hates them and hates their works and the people in the church in Ephesus hate them and hate their works. They led some people astray. They led some people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ into a false gospel, into a different gospel. Despite their lack of love, despite their lack of care and concern, the discernment of the church in Ephesus was okay. They recognized that the Nicolaitans were wrong. They recognized that the Nicolaitans were baddies, if you like. They knew who they could trust and who they couldn't trust. We need the gift of discernment today. We live in days when there are multitudes of false gospel preachers. Men who will lead people astray, who will take people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ into a different gospel, which is really no gospel. And when we hear that message being preached, we need to be discerning about it and say that's a different gospel. It might only be a slight difference, but that's a different gospel. Jesus finishes with a statement then, verse 7, he who has ears to hear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Very similar to, to what we read in the parables of Jesus. Now, what does it mean? What's Jesus driving at here in this letter to the church in Ephesus? Well, those who have ears spiritually will hear the true meaning of the words. As this letter was read to the church in Ephesus, everyone would have heard it. Everyone would have understood the message. But Jesus says there are those who have spiritual ears who will hear the true meaning of the message who will see what it is that I'm really saying to them, who will take this call to repentance seriously, who will work hard at having that love that they had at first. Some will hear it only with their physical ears, while others will hear the true meaning and take it to heart. And the Spirit says, the end of verse 7, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What does the Spirit promise to the one who hears, the one who puts into to action his word? Well, he promises them heaven, doesn't he? The prohibition of eating from the tree that was uh, instituted, Genesis 3, after the fall of man into sin will be gone. Again, men will be able to come and eat from the tree of life. Again, men and women will be able to come and have that eternal life with God. Once again, the people of God will be in the place of God. They will be in the kingdom of God. They will enjoy the paradise and the rest and the presence of God forever. That's the future this morning for all of us who are in Jesus Christ. Those who overcome the trials and tribulations and difficulties of this life. To be one of God's people in God's place, enjoying God forever. 
That's what our shorter catechism teaches us, isn't it? What's man's chief end? Man's chief end is to enjoy God and glorify him forever. The suffering church, the church in Ephesus suffered gladly for the name of Christ, but they were the forgetful church who had forgotten their first love. But Jesus writes to remind them to be the faithful church, to be those who overcome and enjoy God forever. The reality is that in the days to come, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland might be a suffering church. Carried off Presbyterian Church might be a suffering church. But may we never be a forgetful church. And may we always look to Jesus, who will bring us to glory with him forever. Amen. Well, we're going to bring our time together to a close this morning by, as we remain seated uh, and sing the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. stand if you're able for the benediction.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Comforter, rest, remain, and abide with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen.